All right. Well, yes, I want to uh, introduce my guest today. I'm doing everything. The other thing is, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm doing everything left-handed that I would normally do right-handed because I think I've torn my rotator cuff. I'm going to see a surgeon in a week or so. So my guest today, Jason, I'm going to, I hope his name is being pronounced correctly. And if not, he'll help me. Jason Kotecki is an artist, an author, professional speaker. He and his wife, Kim, founded Escape Adulthood and have made it their mission in life, life rather, to help people break free from adult-itis. And that's the topic of today's Jumpstart. So that they can build better lives, businesses, and teams. You can learn more at Escape Adulthood, escapeadulthood.com. I have been singing I Won't Grow Up from Peter Pan ever since I wrote the uh, notes for today's interview. Jason, good morning. How are you? Hello, Will. It is great to be with you today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to spend some time with you. I appreciate you being here. It's a very adult and responsible thing for you. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's early for me, but that but that's okay. It gave me an excuse to get up and going. And uh, I'm not too far away from your user who is from New Berlin, Wisconsin, and Sheboygan, Wisconsin myself. So uh, I can appreciate the sunny day that we have here in Wisconsin. Nice. Well, yes, yeah, she um, gives us the weather report from New Berlin and has been doing so for a couple of years. It's always, I live in Key Largo, Florida, so it's always warm and yep. uh, not everywhere. Well, I want to jump right into this because first of all, I love the concept um, and I'd like you to give us a working definition of adult-itis so we know what we're talking about here. Sure. Well, it's one of those things that a lot of people uh, may be able to figure out just by hearing it. Uh, anyone that has a medical background, you've heard of arthritis, right, which is swelling of the joints. Adultitis is swelling of the adult. Uh, so if you have too much adult, then you probably have adultitis. But basically, it's a disease that my wife, Kim, and I have identified that too many people have. And it's what happens when you lose your uh, zest for life, your childlike spirit. Um, and most importantly, it kind of has you leaving a, a life that's kind of a boring shade of gray, right? So you, you lose your creativity, your zest, your ability to wonder, uh, all, all that sort of thing. And, and it's kind of like, you know, when people think about uh, going to work on a Monday morning and there's that sense of dread, that's adultitis. That would be one example of it. Don't, I'm not trying to be flippant here, but don't most people feel some sort of dread on Monday morning? That seems to be a common malady. Yes. The problem is, uh, is when that rut becomes kind of one of those never ending sort of things. So we're all big on, you know, a lot of people, uh, misconstrue what we talk about as like, we're, we're saying you should uh, quit your job and play with Play-Doh all day long and things like that. And it's really not about getting rid of responsibilities. It's about tapping into that childlike spirit that we all used to have for the benefits that it can give us as adults. A lot of times we're so eager to jump into our, our, our adult lives and we go to college and we, we put on the suit and we do all the things and we leave the childlike side behind. And there's a lot of advantages to, to keeping that as a, as a partner, um, to be able to see opportunities that are in front of us to, uh, you know, so many adults would consider themselves not creative. And the truth is we're all creative, but we need to tap into that childlike side to help us out once in a while. When you said that, I was thinking of the quote from the great Earl Nightingale, when he said that a, gr um, what is it? A grave is nothing more than a, a rut rather is nothing more than a grave with the ends kicked out. That's yeah. it. Yeah. A rut is the, a grave with the ends kicked out. The thing is, I find that no one says, Oh, I'm going to be more adult or I'm going to let my childlike self go to the wayside. How does it happen? Does it, is it over time or is it somewhat cumulative based on adult challenges we face? 
Yeah, you know, it is, it is true. It's interesting about, you know, when we're younger, we have this sort of carefree mentality. And then I think the seeds kind of get planted early on in life where maybe you come to school. Like I remember when I was little, I, I came to school dressed in a Superman shirt and I tried to convince my classmates that I was, in fact, Superman. And uh, as you could imagine, You're that not? Uh, did not go well for me in terms of uh, the shaming and mocking. But I think we all have... you know, those things. And, and we learn that maybe being a little bit too weird uh, is not a good thing. And so we kind of shave off those weird sides and we look a little bit more to making sure we don't stand out too much. Um, and, and as we grow into adulthood, we want to be seen as taken seriously by our peers or bosses or things. And so I think it just sort of happens. And then, as you point out, when you have things like mortgages and, and bills, it's easy to be consumed with With those sorts of things. Um, but one thing that I realized as I when I when I started out my career as a speaker, uh, it was it was about eight years before Kim and I had our first child. And when we finally Kim was finally pregnant, a lot of people would say, oh, my gosh, now you're really going to know what adultitis is because now you're going to have kids. And I started to panic a little bit. I'd be, oh, my career is over. I'm good. This is terrible. But it was interesting because I'd have just as many people would say, oh, my gosh. kids are the greatest thing. They're going to help you with your adultitis and, and it's going to be, you're going to get right back into that childlike way of thinking. And it, it, it occurred to me that it's not kids that give us adultitis or uh, bills that give us adultitis. It's, it's a lot of times it's our own perception and how we choose to uh, look at the challenges we have and the joys we have. And it's a lot more controllable than we think it is. It's interesting when you talk about, um, I think the teenage years really can drive the youthfulness out of us. What are you, a baby? You're still playing with this. You're still doing that, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the other thing is that, as they say in China, the nail that stands up gets hammered down. It's, it's like we get hammered down by our peers because we are different. And then when we become adults, we're like, I'm looking for somebody who's different and creative and everything else for this job. How do you sell this concept to potential speaking clients? The reason I ask is that I'm the world authority on complaining and people think, oh, all he's going to do is complain about complaining. So I have a bit of an education process that I need that we do. And I want to find out, do you people go, you know what? I need my people to be more adult. <clears throat> Well, that's a good question, and, it, and, it, and it's uh, something that we go at it through a couple different ways. Um, so as you, as you know, with the pandemic especially, like people are just fatigued and tired and burned out and um, navigating change. And so the, we come at it from what, is, what are the advantages to what we talk about? So in order to navigate change, you have to look at it differently. And so... Uh, kids look at things differently. So, for example, in the summertime here in Wisconsin, and your new Berlin friend will know this. I don't. I don't think they have these in in Key Largo, but dandelions. So, you know, the springtime is littered with dandelions, and if you're an adult, you see that as a problem. You see it as a weed problem that they have taken over your yard. Got to call a weed guy. But if you're a five year old kid, you see wishes. You see flowers for mom. You see hours of of play. And the reality is, and this is what I love, is both are true. They are weeds, but they are also wishes. And so the cool part is that we have the opportunity to choose. And so that's one of the things that we we encourage clients is to is to uh, give people a new way of looking at things, whether it's their challenges or their or their um, uh, difficulties. And then the other side we come from is innovation. A lot of companies and organizations want their people to be more innovative, and so we look at things from. from a playful sort of, we call it tinkering, which is, which is, is, is a playful word and it, it helps to drive innovation, but in a way that's not so life or death, it's about experimentation. And so those are kind of the angles we take with it. And of course, once people understand what I'm talking about with adultitis, they're like, yeah, we have that. We could, we could use that. And sometimes it's, like I said, from this pandemic where we all have a little bit of adultitis and just the weariness and fatigue. Well, you were saying that there's a key question that we need to be asking ourselves as we emerge from the pandemic to uh, break out of our adultitis. What is that? 
Yeah, this is one of my favorite questions of all time. It's one that uh, my wife, Kim, and I used many, many times throughout the pandemic, and it's this. Now that this has happened, what does this make possible? And anytime, I don't care if it's a global pandemic or not, it, we all have storms that come through our lives. That's actually what this painting represents. Uh, this is a painting that I did, a, a print of it. And it, the idea that we all have storms, but but sometimes those storms come, uh, bring sprinkles or uh, a, a silver lining. And the trick is we have to be looking for it in order to see it. And so it's not about um, burying your head in the sand and pretending like bad things don't happen or that we're disappointed or frustrated or sad when things don't go our way or, or our plans blow up. But what it is, is about picking ourselves up and then asking the question, what does this make possible? So uh, the quick story of that, like this, this pandemic, like this whole set doing virtual, I was one of those speakers. I don't know where you stood. Well, you may have been doing this for years and years. I, I, I have a feeling, but I was like, oh, I could never do virtual stuff. I need to be in front of an audience. And, and then of course, once the pandemic hit and all of the speaking gigs went away, that, that changed my tune. But it was like, well, what does this make possible? And so the very first day after the, the national emergency was declared, Kim and I just opened up our laptop and did a live stream just talking to our people. And the quality was terrible and the lighting was terrible. But every day we got a little bit better and we added a new camera, or learned something about lighting and upped our software. And now over the last couple of years, we've made thousands and thousands of dollars doing this, which was never a thing. But if I would have buried my head in the sand and said, oh, this is terrible, this is the worst, I gotta find another job, I wouldn't be here. And so I think uh, the ability to say, well, what, what good can come from this without ignoring the bad, but saying, what are the opportunities? Because the people who see silver linings are the ones who are looking for them. Well, I, and I appreciate what you had to say. I, I, like you, all of my speaking gigs dried up and I sold my daughter's bedroom furniture and behind me is a green screen and around me is like nine lights. So yeah, it was, it was an adaptation that we had to make to survive. And it, it has certainly improved my overall quality of all videos. So that, yeah, it's a, it, that's a great example. The people that I have seen struggle are the ones who, I don't know, kept thinking that the live gigs were going to open up a lot sooner than they did. You mentioned that uh, adult itis is like space invaders. What does that mean? Well, I, yeah, and I got to apologize in advance for that reference. For some people who may be listening, you have no idea what Space Invaders is. But some of you know, some of you know, they used to have video games with just one one little button on it and a joystick. But Space Invaders is a game that was on the old Atari system. And it would have our, uh, uh, aliens that would descend down the screen and you'd have to shoot them before they made it to the bottom of the screen. And when it comes to adultitis, I wish... There was some magic bullet like, oh, just go to Disney World and you will be cured of adultitis. And the reality is it's sort of like maintaining a, a healthy weight, right? I wish I could eat a salad one day and then eat pizza for the rest of my life. But it doesn't work that way. That every time you, you get all those aliens, a new screen comes up with new aliens. But the good thing about that is if you look at fighting adultitis as a game, Adultitis does its best work when it when it lurks in the shadows and convinces us that everything is so serious and so life or death. But if you can transform um, your challenges into a game, um, it can give you a little bit of a sense of perspective. Like uh, like I just said, that that question of like, what does this now make possible? Kim and I, we have used that as a game. Anytime like we get a flat tire or the dishwasher goes out, it, it's become a reflex now where it's almost a game to try to figure out well, what what good can come from this? How can we make this something positive? And I think that is very helpful uh, when we're dealing with adultitis because uh, it is a challenge and it is always on. Um, but by looking at it as a game, it can kind of uh, take away the seriousness, seriousness. And I think a lot of times if we're honest with ourselves, most of the things we're worried about, A, never happen or B, are never quite as catastrophic as we imagine them to be in our brain. And so bringing that kind of stuff out into the light helps diffuse adultitis of a lot of its power. I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, of, you keep reminding me of Earl Nightingale, who was just the guy who got me into this, inspired me for so many years. And he talked about 
they took an entire city block worth of fog a mile high. And if you distill all that moisture down, it comes up to be about a cup of water. He drew the analogy that we live in this dense fog of fear and worry. Do you think society encourages or discourages adultitis? Oh, I think it encourages it. Um, I think, um, I mean, we can just look at uh, social media technology. I think uh, it encourages us to do, to be faster all the time. It encourages us to compare ourselves with one another and uh, advertising is designed to make us feel less than because, well, we, we don't have that perfect teeth or we don't have that. And so I think, I think society definitely uh, encourages adultitis through a lot of the, a lot of things. Now, of course, technology and things like that, that's all good. I mean, I'm very happy that we can be having this conversation hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Um, but I would definitely say, uh, and you'd said about the, the tall nail, right? I think, uh, people in Australia have a similar thing with the, the tall poppy, uh, syndrome where the, the tall poppy is one that gets cut off. So I think we're also encouraged to conform and be similar it's funny. I, I was reading a book yesterday about people who uh, have ha, have uh, made a living online, and it was a book someone gave to me. And I couldn't believe how many times the backstory was: well, this is something they wanted to do when they were a kid, but then their parents or teacher says, "Well, you can't make money as a as a writer, or you can't do that, or you can't do that." And so then they go into a a safe field like law or medicine or whatever. And then lo and behold, midlife comes and they're like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. And then they shift into something else. Maybe they're forced into it and they end up finding their original true joy uh, that they had all along. And I'm like, why, why do we do that to our kids and to our our, uh, our people? My, I was lucky. My parents were very encouraging. I told them I wanted to be an artist and they were like, there was like crickets, right? But they brought in my high school art teacher and they they had her over for dinner and they said, is he any good? What is out there for him? And uh, she was very complimentary. And she said, here's a lot of different things that artists could do. And and again, I'm not here to say, like, just follow your bliss and everything will work out. It's taken a lot of work to be where we are. My, my wife and I, we live on Lake Michigan in a beautiful home, and that took 20 years to get here. Uh, but I think we do uh, ourselves a lot of distortion. I think society in general, when we discourage people from from going after that thing that lights them up and they're that they're enthusiastic about. So uh, that's my take on it, at least. First of all, I love the picture. I thought it was professional. <laughs> I guess it is. And I love the metaphor behind it. And it seems like a lot of people I know who are about my age, late 50s, have decided that they were meant to be comedians. It seems like I know like five people. And certainly that is not something that most parents encourage people to do. Do you believe in this concept of do what you love and the money will follow? Well, I think I think in general that is true, but I think it's uh, usually it sounds really easy, and people kind of assume it will be. Um, I think that you, I, I truly believe that what you are passionate about is a sign of the direction you should be going. I think uh, uh, in, enthusiasm, as you you may know, it comes from the the word en and theos, which is God within, and I think there's something powerful about that. I think that what we what we think that passion is, or what it, what job it might lead to, is not necessarily correct. I think it's it's a compass, and as we follow that compass, like my wife Kim, um, she's great with people, and she loves kids. And she started out as a kindergarten teacher, and then eventually she realized that she could impact kids more greatly if she reached the parents first. And so we kind of teamed up to do this mission together. And the reality is, is like what she's doing now, the, the core mission is not any different than when she was going to be a kindergarten teacher, but it, 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 it changed. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's too easy to say, just follow your dreams and the money will follow as if like an envelope just comes in the mail and, and it works out. But I think when you have that passion for something, it gives you the fuel to keep going when it's hard. 
And that's the important thing is to keep persisting. Um, that was the thing I told myself. I was like, I'm, I'm not giving up that period. I'm burning the bridges and I'm going for it. And I always knew like if it sucked, I could get a job at McDonald's somewhere. And it was like, okay, so that's the worst case scenario. I've never had to do that, but it's been, it's been hard. Um, but I think that the, the joy is, is kind of the, the compass. And I think it's really important to, uh, to listen to. And, uh, yeah. So I think that it's interesting because when you talk to people at events and I know you do as well, there's, there's a, um, we're supposed to be these big celebrities that get on stage and excite everybody and everything. And we do. And then there are people who think that we somehow are fortunate or that we landed here, et cetera. And I got into Toastmasters when I was in my twenties. People don't realize the amount of work that we put forth and in anything, but that passion was there for me. I got a standing ovation in high school doing a speech and I'm like, that's it. I'm hooked. So that's life. Mm -hmm. How does, how does one other than the Monday itis, et cetera, how do we recognize when we're starting to slip into our adult itis as opposed to our childlike mm -hmm. way of being? And by the way, Child, the word child is often a pejorative term. Childish, you're such a child. We rarely use that as a um, as a compliment. So it sort of reinforces that adultitis thing, I think. It's, uh, yeah, what, one of the things my wife and I joke about is that we, we encourage people to be childlike, not childish. And anyone with a husband may know the difference. Um, but uh, we, you know, I think... I think I think it was Steve Jobs who had a quote that said something to the effect of when you wake up in the morning, are you excited about what you're going to do today? And if you wake up too many days in a row without feeling like you're excited about what you're going to do today, then you might have to reconsider. I, I think that's a really good sign that you have adultitis, because like, as you said, yeah, sometimes we don't always love our job, but even as speakers, I love speaking, but like there's parts of speaking that just suck the loneliness and the travel and and the airports and all that stuff being away from my family but it's worth it for me for a many different reasons and so it's not about like oh every day is perfect and i'm like the uh emmett from the lego movie everything is awesome all the time <laughs> i love um, that song <laughs> right uh it, and it's like it's about being it, i think he said it great it's like if you have too many days in a row Going back to those ruts again, when those routines have been become ruts, I think that's a telltale sign that adultitis has taken over. And uh, when you know there's something you would rather be doing, but you're too afraid uh, to go for it, that's another red flag as well. So can you break out? The, the reason I ask this question is I've written a couple of books on happiness. And one of the things that uh, the research shows is that people who just do things differently, I mean, take a different way to work, eat a different meal, every, don't eat the same thing every day, just bring uh, variety into your life can feel happier. Do you think that variety is a key component to breaking free of adult? I think it is. I think uh, I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Penguins Can't Fly and 39 Other Rules That Don't Exist. And it was about this idea that we we have so many laws and rules that we follow that I don't know why we add more to the list. So there are so many, I call them rules that don't exist that that we abide by. So, you know, I'm supposed to hate Monday mornings or I can't eat dessert first. Or one of my favorite ones is if you're married to someone, you can't swap sides of the bed at night. Um, but I think that that what I encourage people to do to get better, because I think that's a way to fight adultitis is to look for and break rules that don't exist. And one way to do that is, is through variety. So uh, mix up your cereal in the morning. Try, like you said, a different way, uh, way to work. Or when you go to a go to a restaurant, order something you would never order. Or an idea a friend told me is like, ask the waitress to pick something out. Uh, which, you know, again, for some people, it's like, oh, I could never do that. But I think it, it doesn't matter what it is. It's finding out where your comfort zone is or where your routine is and just taking like a little half step outside of it. It's not you don't have to go jumping out of a plane or deep sea diving with great white sharks. It's just finding little things you can adjust. And I think that just it, it builds your muscle for maybe more scary things that are a little bit different than you're used to. 
Um, and I think that helps. It seems like we want to uh, minimize um, threat in our life. And so to do that, we tend to stay fairly close to home, tied to the dock, as it were. I know that I'm guilty of going to the same restaurant, ordering the same thing. So this is awesome. Everybody, just uh, I want to reintroduce, please, our guest today. And I am looking for, <laughs> here we go. Oh, there we go. Jason, pronounce your last name for me. You got it the first time. Kotecki. Kotecki. Good, good, good. All right. This is your chance to like, comment, and share. If you've got a quick question for Jason, throw that in as well. We're just about out of time, and then we're going to do, uh, I think we should do Everything is Awesome is our song of the day. <laughs> Every day, I'll give everybody a chance to chime in with any questions or anything like that. And be sure and do this no matter what format you're watching us in, whether it's a replay through the emails, about 10,000 we send out every day. Uh, be sure and post questions, comments, et cetera. And uh, so at the end of each jumpstart, we do what's called a song of the day. And by copyright, of course, we can't play the song, but everybody listens to it. It's a way of attuning our energy. So I think we should do everything is awesome. Jason, thank you for getting up so early. Thank you for sharing your time and talent with us. It's escapeadulthood.com forward slash chance to download his book, and see all of the wonderful drawings. Thank you. Thank you, Will. It's been a pleasure. Alexa, play Everything is Awesome. Everything is Awesome by Tegan and Sarah, featuring The Lonely Island. Here we go. Music. No more, no more complaining people. Their lives are changing. We're flying high, creating a complaint-free world. No more. Changing, we're flying high, creating a complaint free world. No 